I'm Matt Gishard, and this is No Holds Barred. In today's episode, we're going to talk about child abuse. California Penal Code has a section entitled Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act. That takes in an awful lot. And I want to say, under that act in the Penal Code, there are numerous sections on various aspects of child abuse, all the way from aggravated assaults through death and reporting that, reporting. So let's just start off with essentially what child abuse is defined as in some of the sections. And I want to say the reason why this has come up and people have reached out to me to discuss it is because within the last couple of weeks here in the Bay Area, we have heard of three infants who have died of fentanyl poisoning. And in each one of those three cases, the parents have been charged with murder. So murder is, as we know from a previous podcast, Murder is the killing of a human being or fetus with malice of forethought. So, interesting murder. Let's go straight to Penal Code Section 273A. Is willful harm or injury to a child endangering that person's health? It can be a misdemeanor. It can be a felony. So, we often see 273. And how does it come up? Well, I recall when I was a prosecutor a number of years ago, we had sight hearings where we'd sometimes call people in who had been accused of a crime and have a discussion with them before it, they were charged. And I remember a fellow coming in from another country. His son had been at school and his son was in the seventh grade. And during PE, a coach had noted a number of bruises on his back and across the back of his legs. And he had asked the young boy, what, you know, what's going on? My father, this is punishment by my father. He regularly takes a belt to us. Now back then, unfortunately, the crime of child abuse was not treated as it is today. The peril that kids go through when we see the kinds of bruises on that boy now we wonder how many times that has happened, how many other people, and if a father can do that kind of punishment, goodness, what else can they do? So we get onto it much sooner. But at that time, we called that father in, and I had a meeting with him, and he told me in his country that was totally appropriate. He did it, and I was not going to tell him how he was going to raise his child. And I told him that as a courtesy, we had called him in to determine what actually happened and if he is the one who did that. But because he didn't want to cooperate with us, we were going to move forward and charge him with child abuse. Now there are many more statutes that protect children. We hear about these horrible cases where the authorities have gone into a home multiple times and seeing abuse and they've actually done nothing. And why is that? Well, going way back in our history and all the way through today, we have this problem where we're kind of balancing kids being with their parents, keeping families together. That is a societal benefit. We want that and balance that against except the child is in danger in that family, is in danger in that environment. So do we work with the parents to try to make them understand do we yank the child out? And many times we hear about that. The child has been taken away, child protective services, put in a foster home, and then returned. And then again, the abuse happens. Or it's worked. The parents have gone through training. The police have gone through training. People know how to approach this. So there's the, certainly the good news and the bad news. Sadly, today, I'm going to talk about mostly the bad news. Penal Code Section 273 AB, assault resulting in death, comatose state, or paralysis 
of a child under the age of eight. The penalty for that is 25 to life, just as is a first degree murder. And that 273B is putting a child as a result of abuse in paralysis or comatose. And in that case, the penalty is life with the possibility of parole. So incredible sanctions for injuring a child, a helpless child. And that's kind of what we're looking at here is the 273D of the penal code, corporal punishment or injury of a child, one who willfully inflicts upon a child cruel or inhuman corporal punishment or injury resulting in a traumatic condition is guilty of a felony. So you think about that, well, what is a traumatic conviction? What is inhumane or cruel treatment? And we know children are kind of helpless. This even takes into account psychological injury. So what we're trying to do, and my purpose today, is to educate all of you on the issues. There is a way to solve the problem, but it requires intervention. And by reading this, I'd like people to know that there, this is the law and these are sanctions. So we know of these murders and you think to yourself, well, what kind of murder is it if a parent has a drug problem and has fentanyl lying around the house and the child gets a hold of it, ingests it, or it's in the air because a parent is using it and a child dies as a result of that and they are charged with murder. Is it a first degree murder with killing of a human being with malice of forethought? Is it an inherently dangerous act, second degree murder? It's probably what it is, a second degree murder. Um, so we run into this all the time. Part of the act, when I read about it, is reporting. So let's talk about that. Let's jump forward to that just for a moment. We have reporting and California has in that act defines mandatory reporters. And that's within the last several decades we've had that issue of mandatory reporting. And who might that be? It's not a neighbor. Neighbor could see it. There's no mandatory reporting by a neighbor, but many neighbors do. Mandatory reporters are teachers, just like that case I talked about at school. So if a teacher sees evidence of child abuse, they have a mandatory duty to report it to the police and social services. So in many cases, many counties have a child protective services, and that's social services agency. So report it to the police. Sometimes the police say, well, we'll report it to social services. But principals of schools, social workers come into the house for whatever reason and see abuse. Doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, therapists, child care providers, and police officers. So by statute, those are the mandatory reporters. And thankfully for that, because many times those are the ones who see child comes in for a, uh, an examination by a nurse or a doctor, and there's evidence of abuse, they have a mandatory duty to report that. And they can get in trouble if something comes up later and what the heck, there's this long history of abuse and this nurse or this doctor or this teacher, or this principal, or whatever, saw it and did nothing about it. So the reason for these mandatory reporters is so that people will recognize it, hopefully, and move forward. Psychological abuse is a little tougher, but it's abuse nevertheless. And it's important that people report that. So we have Child Protective Services, and they often get in trouble. I was reading an article uh, just recently in a magazine, a legal uh, treatise about that Child Protective Services is falling in so many communities is falling below the standard. Now, in many cases, they'll say we're overworked. There are too many people to see. There are lots of reasons. And we missed that. So in one of the recent fentanyl death cases in the Bay Area, 
we heard about that, that social services had been in the household numerous times, had observed that there was drug paraphernalia in the house, that there was no food in the refrigerator, the place was filthy, the child didn't appear to be washed, lots and lots of reasons that should have raised the alarm. But let's assume that they had raised the alarm. What to do? Child Protective Services. What are they supposed to do? What do we expect them to do? Do they remove the child from the home? Do they have the parents come in and counsel them? Do they have the police arrest the parents? What, what, what do we do? Because we see these things and we hear too often about evidence that's clear about abuse or neglect. Remember, the act isn't just abuse, it's neglect. So a child who's not fed, who's not treated properly for medical issues is part of this act of protecting children because why? They are, they and the elderly are the most vulnerable in our society. They need people to watch out for them. And if a parent has a drug problem and can't care for them, then society needs to step in. And we have mandatory reporters to assist in recognizing that particular problem. So when you see somebody with cigarette burns, a child on the bottom of their feet, or use of a belt, um, wow, it's time. It's absolutely time uh, to get some help. I was on a board at one time and we had a shelter where kids were removed from homes and put in this East Bay shelter just for protective purposes. It could be for a day or two or more before we could get them into uh, a foster care facility. And foster care in many cases is temporary. So I knew a number of people that would take in foster kids for, for a brief period of time while things got sorted out uh, with their living uh, facilities and pretty important. I will say that at one point I headed the, uh, the homicide team in the district attorney's office and we had a very troubling series of shaken baby cases. So we would have uh, a, a baby who was um, in some cases dead, in some cases comatose, in some cases something had happened and oftentimes uh, from a medical standpoint it was initially thought as is well a, a syndrome of we hear that that the, the child just turned wrong slept wrong some some issue that caused them to lose consciousness um, the child died at autopsy you'd see these little petechiae in the brain different colors meaning that there were different little uh, of these petechiae these hemorrhages of different colors which would tell the pathologist and tell us that they happened at different times. So shaken baby syndrome is, we call it the coup contra coup. So a little baby's head, the skull, and the brain is inside, and if shaken, and sometimes just one severe shake, and that brain can bounce around in the skull and get um, these little hemorrhages. Enough of those over time can kill a child or severely injure the child. So when you see that the baby goes into a, a child care and is terrified, doesn't want to go, uh, becomes lethargic, those are signs that we need to recognize. And those are child abuse. That, that's, that's what that is. And we tried a number of murder cases in which in some cases it was a parent. In most cases, in my experience, it had been a caregiver. Um, we had cases where a parent, uh, the caregiver came into the home for the child, and the child would be terrified, and I don't want so-and-so to come in, uh, and wasn't eating, and was lethargic, and the parent put a, uh, a camera in the house and determined that, in fact, that the child was being, and the, ba the baby was being abused by the caregiver that they had hired to care for the child. So we've all heard of those kinds of stories. As we go back to what I was talking about, these various uh, rules um, having to do with child abuse, and the flow is actually into even domestic violence. So, so often when we look at 
domestic violence, somebody in a home is abusing, say, the mother, but also abusing the children. So we have this crossover between uh, domestic violence cases and this uh, act, which I want to repeat is the Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act. Very important. And within that, a number of sections. So I'll be interested to follow, and we can talk about it in another or a, a session of No Holds Barred, about what actually has happened in those cases in the Bay Area in which parents have been charged with murder for their child being exposed to fentanyl poisoning. So well, let's, let's kind of see how that works out within this parameters of, um, of child abuse. This is not the end of it, it's just the beginning, but I wanted to raise this issue for people to make them aware of what the rules are and how they may be applied. And then in another session, No Holds Barred, we can actually talk about the history and what has happened, what is the result, what is the sanction in real cases that we hear about on the news. So stay tuned for that episode of No Holds Barred. And with respect to this episode, if you have comments, please put them in the chat. Very important. I like to read those, and I'm anxious to read them so that that gives us some ideas as to what we want to do in the future. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.